Hi, welcome to the second part of these videos, which are going to cover my pre my very old lecture called on measuring lengths. So this is where we had stopped in part one. We had seen that the French Academy of Sciences uh, realized that there's a need to standardize units of measurement and they proposed using nature in order to do that. So let's first try and understand how one can use nature itself, the laws of nature to come up with a unit of measurement. So one possible way is to use a simple pendulum. So this is a simple pendulum. It's basically a bob connected by hanging by a thread and oscillating, right? Now, if you know your physics, you can easily show that the time period, that is the time taken for one full oscillation is something is given by a formula, which is two pi root L by G, where L is the length of the simple pendulum and G is what we call acceleration due to gravity. So when you throw an object, uh, the Earth's gravitational force accelerates that object and that is a constant at any given place. So using these two quantities, you can predict what the time period will be. So the basic proposal was that can we construct a simple pendulum whose time period is two seconds? Then we will define the corresponding length that you need to get a two seconds pendulum should be one meter. Now there are two problems with this. First of all, what is a second? Back in around the French Revolution, we did not have a very reliable definition of a second. So that was not going to be possible. The other thing is that the acceleration due to gravity changes from place to place. Uh, so if you are at a lower altitude, uh, things are, uh, the acceleration due to gravity is higher. And if you are at a very high height or altitude, the uh, acceleration due to gravity is weaker. So clearly this is not a good idea. So here was another method that was proposed. We'll take a quadrant. So what is a quadrant? We know that the earth is a sphere. We know there is a pole and then there is the equator. We will take a line along the surface from the pole to the equator. That is what is called a quadrant. So the proposal was that if somehow you could measure a quadrant, what we can do is we can uh, divide it into 10 million parts and one part would be one meter. So that was the new proposed definition of a meter. But the question is, how do you go to the equator from the North Pole? It's not an easy journey. There are seas in between, there's oceans, the journey is not possible. Mountains will hinder you and so on and so forth. So here is where we use trigonometry to help us out. So let's look at a cross section of the earth, which is a circle, right? So let's say B is a place, the point B is a place on the equator and A is some point other than the pole, somewhere else. And let's say that the angle that these two points subtend or put at the center is X degrees, right? So if P is a letter that denotes the pole, then you can use trigonometry to uh, measure the distance from pole to the equator by actually using the distance between A and B. So this is what uh, we can do. Instead of uh, measuring the whole distance, you measure part of the total quadrant and you can then use trigonometry in order to get the full distance. All right. Now, how do you measure the angle? That is the problem. By the way, I am not explaining the trigonometry. So feel free to go back, pause the video. And if you know your trigonometry, you can verify how the trigonometry works here. But all you need to understand is using trigonometry, we can bypass the problem of doing the whole distance measurement and measure only part. The next important question is to use even trigonometry, you need that X degrees. So if I can go back to my slides, uh, this is uh, the X degrees that we want to measure. So how do you measure that? Well, you can do it using your knowledge of astronomy. So what happens uh, is that there is something called as the pole star. 
So the earth is rotating. You have an axis of rotation and there is a star at the North Pole, very close to the North Pole, which is called the Pole Star, which in uh, Indian tradition we also called Dhruvatara. So the beauty of the Pole Star is because it is along the line of axis of rotation. When the earth rotates, the Pole Star remains fixed. And the angle between the surface and uh, the pole star, right, is equal to the latitude where you are. So if you are at the equator, the pole star will be exactly at the horizon. If you go, say, 10 degrees uh, north of equator, the pole star will be 10 degrees north, uh, 10 degrees above the horizon. But it will remain fixed. So that is how we can use astronomy to infer the angle between two places A and B. Now is the tricky question. How do you measure the actual arc length? Well, for that you use geodesy. And geodesy largely uses <coughs> sorry, a technique known as triangulation. So here is what triangulation means. I have two points, the two blue points between which I want to measure the distance. That's U. So we need to find out what U is. So what we do is that we choose two red points on either side. So if I'm standing here, I will choose one point to the left, another point to the right, and I will measure the distance between these two, right? Between the two red points that I have chosen, which are very close by. I will then stand on um, at one red point and I will measure the angle between uh, uh, the line joining the two red points and the line uh, looking at the blue point. Similarly, I will measure the angle from that side and then I can use trigonometry in order to measure U. Now remember. Depending on how small the angle you can measure, there is only a certain distance up to which you can measure using triangulation. If you want to measure a very large distance, like, a dis uh, like what was needed for the measurement of a quadrant or a part of the quadrant, you need to construct multiple triangles. So you need to find two points, construct a triangle, measure the distance. Go to the next point, find another point, measure, create a system of triangles and then move forward. And that is exactly what was done. So here is a map of Europe. On the northmost point, you can see uh, Dunkirk. The southernmost point is uh, Montserrat, Barcelona. It's not perfectly clear. And what is shown in this map is a system of triangles that was painfully constructed to measure the distance along the green line, which is what the quadrant that was chosen in order to define eventually the meter. And this uh, particular green line is known as the dalamber mccain meridian. This is named after these two people, uh, Jean-Baptiste uh, Joseph Delambre and Pierre McCain. These were the two gentlemen who used these painful triangulation method, constructed a system of triangles and managed to measure the part of the quadrant needed to define the meter. This is a Borda's repeating circle, which is uh, basically an instrument used to measure the angles. And uh, based on the measurements of D'Alembert and McCain, uh, the newly founded Bureau of uh, International Measurements created a platinum bar. Okay. The platinum bar is defined as one meter. Okay. But there are problems with this bar. First of all, the bar can get eroded because you see it's made of a material. The material can interact with oxygen and other gases and it can corrode. Or even in the process of moving it from place to place, removing it, it can get wear and tear and it will uh, get eroded. The other is that uh, as the temperature changes, the length of the bar also changes because of what we call thermal expansion. So people said, okay, let us decide that we are going to use the bar at zero degrees Celsius and only that is defined as a meter. 
the next thing they proposed was to lock up that bar in a chamber and uh, and so that it, no gas could interact with it and very minimal interaction happens now this is where metallurgy comes in people realize that instead of using a platinum bar you can actually create a bar which is a mixture of platinum and iridium and the other important uh, thing that they did is that after constructing a very lengthy bar they put two marks on it and it is the distance between these two marks that is a meter okay now why is that important because even if at the edge the bars get damaged or corroded what matters is the distance between the lens so that was another improvement that came along then metallurgists were also able to explain that you can have a greater strength in the bar and a better resistance to corrosion and a better uh, resistance to temperature changes if you use a certain cross section called as the tresca cross section so this is how the bar looks from the other end if you look at from end uh, from the side sorry from this end the end of the bar this is how the cross section looks like so what happened was that 30 such bars were made and distributed to the countries the bar which was closest to the meter was maintained in the bipm then every country would have their own bar and all the man manufacturers in that country would use that bar as a reference and every now and then for confirmation they the people would be appointed from each country they would go to bipm and they would check whether the the agreement is still there or not and with this method we were able to maintain the accuracy of a meter to about a level of 0.1 to 0.3 micro meters it's interesting to note that while the meter was actually defined as 1 by 10th millionth of the quadrant of earth obviously because of the lack of good instruments at that time and all kinds of difficulties de lambert and mccain made some mistakes in their calculations so according to this definition the meter that we use today is actually slightly shorter but it doesn't matter what matters is that the definition of meter remains same throughout the world that is more important than it being exactly equal to 1 by 10th millionth of a quadrant and the other important thing is uh, that the earth is not a perfect sphere so because of the forces that are created by virtue of rotation there is an effect called flattening that takes place so at the poles the earth is actually slightly flat and it's actually very close to a sphere near the equator and therefore trigonometry will not give the perfect answers uh, if you assume a perfect sphere you will have to make some corrections and you can get a full understanding of this entire story if you actually see this book known as the measure of all things by ken alder very nice book which documents the entire history of what i just explained okay so the meter that we use today is not defined uh, as i just explained it to you and uh, but that we will see in the third part because we need some more concepts in order to understand how the modern meter is defined so i'll see you in part 3 of the series of videos on measuring lens thank you